It seems like every art YouTuber, myself included, have made videos surrounding how to find your art style. But I feel like there's a part of this conversation that we're often leaving out, which is what is an art style? Like, like actually, like, what is it? You might agree or you might not, but I think an art style is an amalgamation of so many different things. It's the sum of the decisions that you make while creating, be it consciously or subconsciously. But the more I looked into different definitions of an art style, what the term really means, the more I realized it was so much more than that. Developing your art style is a lot like developing your handwriting. So when I was first learning to write in school, I was handed these worksheets. They contained like the perfect ideal letter. And the other students and I would dutifully copy the letters over and over again until we learned the alphabet. Over time, of course, our handwriting evolved from that. We wrote the letters in a way that felt more natural to us, that we liked more, and slowly our handwriting became something ingrained in our very being. We couldn't imagine writing any other way. We took the alphabet and made it our own. I went from having to look at an example of the letter A to write it to having such a thorough, deep understanding of the shape that I could twist and bend its proportions while still maintaining its legibility as the thing that it is. If you were writing something down and it looked over your shoulder and asked you why you were doing it that particular way, you wouldn't know how to answer me. When you sign a check at a restaurant, you're not agonizing over how perfect your signature is. You've done it so many times, you could do it in your sleep. You know how it's done. And I feel like there is a part of our art style that is like this that is subconscious, that's tied very deeply to the decisions that we make when we aren't thinking. But that's also just the foundation of it. You can refine your art style just like you can your handwriting. You are not born with some immutable style that you can never change. Your handwriting, just like your art style, will likely change and evolve as you get older. You are further and further refining that base foundation through endless cycles of repetition. Maybe you're watching a movie and you see a character write their ease a certain way. And you're like, yeah, I think that's cool. And so you teach yourself how to do that over and over and over until some version of it filtered through you and your abilities comes natural to you. It becomes a part of your handwriting, a part of your style. So then it's not really just about our subconscious decisions then. Our art style also has to be a sum of our preferences and experiences as people. But it's also even more than that because we're often operating in a world with limitations and constraints. And so our solutions to those problems will of course have have an impact on our style. So I'm not an animator, but it doesn't take an expert to know that animation is really hard. Trying to draw a character's hand realistically involves having to draw that in almost any conceivable position and lighting situation. That would take an enormous amount of effort, and it's a problem with a capital P. The solution to this problem is stylization, purposefully reducing an incredibly complex object into something far easier to animate but still readable as the thing that it is while also being visually appealing. Take Spirited Away, for example, and all of the Studio Ghibli films for that matter. The animation is not hyper-realistic, and that's not only in response to the limitations of the medium during that period, but a stylistic choice. They took the constraints of that medium and they made it something that was to their advantage, that they innovated from. And if you're like me and you like having those movies in the background, you might be interested in checking out the sponsor of this week's video, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is an incredibly affordable and reliable VPN that not only keeps your information secure by encrypting your data when you're in places like airports or using public Wi-Fi in cafes, but it also allows you to bypass geo-blocks and government restrictions to watch your favorite content anywhere in the world. Surfshark has over 3,000 servers in 95 plus countries, making it super easy to bypass any geo block or government restriction. By choosing a server in the UK and refreshing my Netflix tab, I can gain access to dozens of Studio Ghibli films that I would otherwise have to pay a separate subscription for. Surfshark was already an incredibly affordable VPN, but you can use my code SPOOKYCAT for an additional 83% off and three months free. That's kind of insane.
They also have a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can add an unlimited number of devices to a single account. Thank you so much again to Surfshark, and now let's get back to the content. So let's go back to the definition that we've come up with so far. An art style is, at least in part, both the sum of all of our experiences and preferences as artists, as well as the solution to a problem that we might encounter while creating. And that problem can take many different forms. Let's take painting outside, for example also called plein air painting. It is a challenge for even the most advanced painters. Painting outside comes with a whole host of problems that you have to deal with. Lighting and weather conditions can change in an instant outdoors, meaning that you might get halfway through a painting before the composition and the lighting changes entirely. That imposes an unknown time constraint on any given lighting situation, which means that it's going to change but you don't know when, and you don't know how long you're going to have the scene that you currently have. The resulting solution to this problem is that plein air paintings often look very loose and impressionistic. You have to get the feeling of the scene down as fast as possible so that you still have something to work with if the lighting changes on you. But that obstacle that you have to solve could also come in the form of a physical limitation. Renoir was a famous impressionist painter, but toward the end of his life, he suffered from severe and debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, making it really difficult and eventually impossible for him to hold a brush on his own. But he didn't stop creating. He desperately wanted to continue making art, even as his ability to experience the physical world was severely restricted for him. He had to find solutions in the form of how he was supposed to hold his brush, the way that he moved his canvas, and that, of course, affected his style. While Renoir's earlier work had backgrounds full of activity and intricate detail, his later work features less elaborate backgrounds designed to draw the viewer toward the focal point of the painting. He no longer had the ability to do immense detail throughout the entire composition, and so he narrowed his efforts. He changed his style. He had his children tie his brush to his hand with a series of soft cloths, commission specially designed wheelchairs to help him navigate difficult terrain, and I love this part, okay? Renoir apparently nursed cats while painting so they would stay on his lap and keep him warm, and now a key component of verifying the authenticity of a Renoir painting in his later work is the presence of cat hair. I love that. Like, I love that so much. But does that mean that the cat hair is a part of his style? If you define style as a recurring pattern in our work, then yeah, maybe. But was it Renoir's intent to have cat hair in his paintings? If I snap my fingers and the cat hair is gone, Renoir's work doesn't really change in any notable way. It's still the same painting, it just doesn't have cat hair on it now. And as a cat owner myself, I can attest to the fact that cat hair on my paintings is completely unintentional and actually something that bothers me a lot. But in so much that Renoir's work is an autobiography, the story of his life seeping through these subjects and the backgrounds he chose, and the way he made his marks on the surface, the advancement of his skills over time, and yeah, the progression of his disease. The cat hair is a part of that, I guess, as silly as that sounds. So maybe it's not a part of his style, but it is a part of his art, or at least the story of his life. And at its core, art is really all about that. It's about telling a story, conveying a feeling. Art is communication. It has a thesis statement. Sometimes that thesis statement is just that you wanted to make something pretty. That is what Renoir thought art should be. But sometimes art conveys an even deeper meaning, one that can echo through the centuries and leave an impact on people long after you're gone. The way that you choose to communicate in your art, or honestly, whether you choose to communicate anything at all, can be a component of your art style. So my boyfriend and I have pretty overlapping tastes when it comes to our art preferences, which is useful when we're decorating our apartment, but there's one big exception. I care a lot about the storytelling and the context in a certain piece, and he doesn't. As long as he thinks it's pretty, it's good enough for him. He has completely divorced the art from the artist, but I haven't. I don't think there's anything wrong with either approach, but they're just different. I can appreciate Picasso's work, for example. like the impact he's had on the art history canon, but 
he was also a terrible person, especially to women. And that affects my perception of his work. I just like it less, if I'm being 100% honest with you. And the same goes with storytelling in the art itself. And to demonstrate what I mean here, I want to talk about my favorite artist and really my favorite painting of all time. But to do that, I want to give a little bit of a content warning. The art that I'm about to show is fairly violent in its depiction of the scene involved and the discussion around that work of art is going to involve SA and IRL violence against women. It's going to be brief, but if that's not a thing that you're interested in seeing, I would skip to the timestamp below. So Artemisia Gentileschi is really my favorite artist of all time, and she is now, but she was not always, one of the most famous female painters across all of history. Artemisia was an immensely talented Baroque painter during the early 1600s. She gained some critical acclaim during her life, that's true, but it was during a time when the field was overwhelmingly dominated by men and women's rights in Rome were being increasingly restricted during this period. Women were seen as the literal physical and legal property of their fathers and later their husbands. There are several academic articles talking about the portraits of women during this period, how even in the art depicting them, they were stripped of their agency, often painted in profile view, whereas men were painted as looking directly at their audience, being able to meet their audience head on, and there's power in being able to look back at the people who are looking at you. Artemisia showed immense promise at an early age and was tutored by both her own father and a variety of other artists. And one of those male tutors took advantage of her in an unforgivable way that I can't talk about on YouTube. The incident was prosecuted, but Artemisia faced even more violence at the legal system that was supposed to bring her attacker to justice. And a year later, she painted this. This is Judith slaying Holofernes, a depiction of a story found in the Book of Judith, an apocryphal book of the Bible in the Old Testament. Holofernes is an Assyrian general who aspires to wipe out Judith's people, and in response, she seduces and unalives him, quite rather violently. Early feminist critics interpreted this piece as Artemisia's visual revenge against her attacker, while later art historians would just consider it a part of her consistent pattern of portraying strong female characters. But I look at this painting and I see Artemisia's rage. I see her darkest fantasies painted in full Baroque contrast. I see how the legal system not just wronged her, but committed even more violence against her and how she itched to mete out her own revenge, her own justice. Now, you might be asking yourself why this has literally anything to do with art style, but I would argue that it has everything to do with art style. Every time I look at this painting, it's like I'm seeing it for the first time. The storytelling just hits me full force. It has an impact. This is a painting that I will remember for the rest of my life. And I can't say that for any other version of this piece. There are dozens of other paintings painted by equally talented, equally famous artists, but none of them have the impact of this one. Not Caravaggio's, where Judith is just a child and the lighting and the composition look like something out of a stage play. It's overdramatized. It's fake looking. Not Johann Lisa's version, which is a technical masterpiece, of course, but it's devoid of all emotion. Not Cristofano Allori's, which is just some weird drama between him and his mistress, apparently. And not Klimt's, which, while it's gorgeous and I love it, it doesn't tell a story in the same way. It's not the kind of painting that's going to keep me up at night, even though I know it was made with love and care and immense technical skill. Artemisia's version stands out because it's like we're in the room. We're feeling what she felt. There's an intensity to it. Every other version shies away from this violence, the reality of it. They paint Judith as beautiful, young, her clothes spotless, but Artemisia's version tells us the truth. There is so much power in the storytelling that you imbue into your art. And that's why there's so much more to your art style than just the colors that you choose or the way you make your marks. It's in your state of mind. It's your past, your present, your future, everything in your life that has led you to this moment. 